this is the thing. I wanted Anoju to remain in my like craven fantasies <laughs> to the grave. Anyang SAO, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists, and your K Romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. So, look, if you're not following us on Instagram, you should be. I mean, you should be a, our patron on Patreon. You should. But <laughs> you should also follow our Instagram because um, it's pretty hopping. And so I <sighs> related to our Instagram because we posted about this. Which is at Afternoona Delight. Is podcast. Is podcast on there too? <laughs> I can never remember. Me either. What is it? Afternoon of Delight Podcast. Yeah, it's Afternoon of Delight Podcast on Instagram. So on Sunday, I learned a shocking thing that has honestly just really uprooted my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> just lay it all out there. So uh, my son had a soccer game that was outside and the sun was shining for once in Pennsylvania. And so at, uh, at night I looked at my husband's face and I said, I think you got some sun. I think you should probably like put some lotion on before bed to like soothe it. Cause it's a little red. And he's like, all right. And I was like, well, why don't you go wash your face so that I can then like give you like, like a, like a good lotion, not just like whatever you use. And he looks at me and he's like, I don't need to wash my face. And I said, what do you, you should wash your face before you put on lotion. And he says, I have not washed my face since college. <laughs> Was that a proud statement? <laughs> Look, we are 40. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, excuse me? And, and like, I need to explain to you that my husband is extremely vain. Extremely vain. Like, uh, I, we've, we've been together since we were 18. And I'm still not allowed to touch his hair. I don't think I've ever run my fingers <laughs> through his hair because I'm oh, not really? allowed. I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to touch his hair. What do you uh, mean? During, like, even intimately? Do not touch his hair. It's like, it's like, it, I think it's like nails on the chalkboard, nails on a chalkboard oh to my him. Oh God, really? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, when we, when I had to cut it during COVID, when I had to help him, I, my life was on the line cutting his hair. Like truly, truly. I need you to understand. So I don't think, I, he be, buys, because he buys, you were like, cutting it and he was afraid it was going to be a bad cut? Yeah. Oh, okay. He would have okay. killed me. He would have killed me if it looked bad. And you should like, have jokingly bought, just dropped a bowl on his head and be like, all right, sit still. Right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going the Amish way now. <laughs> um, like he buys like a shampoo bar from Lush for himself. Like this, like he takes care of himself. So I, I don't know. I guess I just assumed, I assumed he used face wash. Like, is that crazy of me to just like assume that he had proper face wash? Like, I'm not the type of wife, like we don't have the type of marriage where like I buy his like hygiene products. Like Correct. He, he goes and buys his own shit when he needs it. Like he's very self-sufficient. So I just assumed he had been buying lotion or I'm sorry, face wash. And if not, he was using mine. But apparently, no, he has not been washing his face at all. Like he's like, sometimes I like run my hand over it with my like shampoo bar. And I was like, what? You can't. What? Like a bar of soap doesn't count. Like I, I'm talking to me. If you wash your face, it doesn't have to be expensive. You can buy like CeraVe for like six dollars. I'm talking just like facial wash. <laughs> you know, correct. So here's the thing I want to add to that that I like literally just thought of, and I saw this. I think it was. I think it was on Jimmy Fallon. Something. It was something to the extent where, and they asked like a few like men and women like who were around that we don't face the same way in the shower, men and women. Wait, what? What? When you shower, do you face the water spray or do you put the water spray to your back? To I my back. It. To my back. No, I always face You it. face the water. You're you're, <laughs> you're a man. Then you're I mean, <laughs> you're, you're you're what a typical man does according to Yeah, it was it was I only <laughs> ever have faced the water. Oh my gosh, never. Never, Never face the water. But that's how you're getting clean. No, that's how I wash my. That's how I, I wash. I wash my face and rinse it off, and then I turn back around 
and do everything else. I'm not getting blinded by the spray. So what I was going to say is maybe he's considering his face clean because he just faces the water and it's always getting sprayed. Yeah, I mean, I posted I posted on my personal Instagram about this. I really wasn't going to involve after Nuna. But then Leah saw it and was like, oh, my God, I need well, to find out. just had a sinking feeling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I saw this and I was like, oh, my God, that's what a monster Neil is. And then I was like, yeah. wait a second. <laughs> because need I to find out. Not yeah. Buy, I don't buy things for my husband. Like, I would never buy him his deodorant. Right. I don't buy him, like, his, like... Like, that business is his business. Right. Same. I don't take, you know, that's not my labor. Right. But then I was like, wait, I also do share, like, a medicine cabinet that, like, is, like, you know, has different doors. But I'm like, suddenly I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) Trying to catalog whether or not you've seen, like, face wash. (laughs) And I'm also like, I don't think I've ever actually, like, watched him wash his face. And then I was like, and I'm very positive he doesn't like moisturize like it all just kind of like hit me in like one moment (laughs) and so i texted him and i said (laughs) just out of of nothing do you wash your face yeah i said do you wash your face and he wrote back and i he said yes and i was like okay phew and then i immediately was like what do you use to wash your face and Megan I shared this with you do you want to give the answer he said water <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean they're facing the shower spray and considering the job done <laughs> look I faced the shower spray and I use face wash yeah I said Neil I have face wash in the shower you have not been using that and he's like no and I'm like, why not? It's but like, since college, he just has like, just let a water. film. There's like a film that has been collecting. Like, and this is the thing that's for crazy. Twenty is that years in college, he had acne so bad he had to go into Accutane. He wore his retainer until he was like 24. We are talking about a vain man, and you're telling me that you <laughs> wash like we got married, and all of a sudden you don't give a shit and you don't wash your face. I just and so I posted this on Instagram, and then. I decided to post a bunch of pictures of Edong Wook because we all know Edong Wook like use has a whole skincare routine. Yeah, like no. we know. Homie, homie's got it dialed. I mean, he probably like does not use lube. He like jacks off with vitamin C. Like every, <laughs> <laughs> he's like my dick has never been so yeah. like <laughs> silky soft. Retinol, like, vitamin C. There are the no, whole, yeah, all of it. There are no wrinkles on my ball sacks. Like he is. <laughs> Like, and so uh, I, I really amused myself, and I had this like whole thread about how Edong Gook needs to like teach our husbands how to take care of their skin. Um, so thank you for everyone who responded to that because um, I think he, I, I don't, I like now I'm like I need you to watch K dramas. Like now I need you to see that like proper men <laughs> are putting on face masks. Well, here's the problem is it's just like, what is the like mask, the toxic masculinity messages they got at some point that like, it's fine to just not give a shit to like, because I was also thinking like my husband doesn't like feeling like he looks old right now. Like I'll take pictures and I'll show it to him and he'll be like, no, I don't like it because I'm like too wrinkly. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, we'll genes you some all. genetics come for us all. Age comes right. for us all. Right. But you can enhance what you have with the proper routine. You surely can. And when you have hair coming out of ears and noses, eyebrows unhinged. (laughs) (laughs) Like, we can take care of that. And I mean, like, yeah, you don't need to live that way. I mean, like, sometimes I'll just be like, you know, like, you know, like your eyebrows. He's got like this very... He's got a lot of personality in those eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you don't need to like, you don't need to have that be your struggle. Like that does not need to be your life. Like you could go to the barber and be like, take off like four inches of those eyebrows and like, please just trim it down to like, you know, like where you don't need to be when you like you pull it out. There's just like so much hair. Like it just like, I have what. I have wild eyebrows. If I go to like a salon and get them waxed, they always cut them. 
Yeah. Like they have to cut them because my eyebrows are just so crazy. I have to trim mine so, too sometimes. Like I'll get like, yeah, they, they, they grow longer sometimes than my hair does, but I trim them. Like, see, I wish I could. I'm actually envious of your nice eyebrows because I have, look at me, like my eyebrows are so fucking sparse. It's like, I'll lend you. You, I was gonna say, like, you, you, you gotta be a hairy Eastern European Jew and then you get the thick eyebrows. Well, you're on trend right now, whereas, like, you know, I'm still rocking naturally the looks that were hot in, like, you know, 1993. I was going to say, although because I tweezed and waxed them, like, all throughout the 90s, the shape they have now is a 90s shape. Like, I I would have to pencil in to do what's on trend now. Mm. So, and I did ask Neil, I was like, is it, was it, is this, like, some toxic masculinity stuff? And he's like, no, like, I... Which, not, not for Neil, because, again, Neil buys, like, special, like, pomade for his hair, like... Not, not him. Does like, I, he want face wash now. Like now that he well, knows no. Now he's like, now he's like, if it's not broke, if it's if it's, it's not, not broke, broke, I'm not fixing fix it. it. Yeah, like he's basically like, well, now I'm not changing. Like, were well, you I'm like, doing. well, maybe it is a little broke. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe it could be that. like a little like. I should you know? say that. I know. I should. Well, okay, so that happened, and I was like, you know what? Okay, I think we've we've overcome. Like, I feel okay. I guess about the fact that you don't. Use face wash. I worked it out with Edong Uk. I like, you know, I felt like I exercised the demons. And then on Monday, he's like, I have to run to the shoe store because I think I've told everyone he's a runner. Okay. So he's like, I I need to run to the shoe store. I need some, I need some more like socks because he buys like special running socks and he was going to get some for me too. And I was like, great. So he comes home and I'm making lunch and he takes off his shoe. He wore them home. Yeah. He puts his foot down puts his foot down like right in front of me and says completely serious so i'm trying these new socks and they are toe socks <laughs> just they're black at least they're not blue they are not anoju blue toe socks but they are black toe socks and he spread his toes and i screamed like i'm talking like could not believe this was happening because he's dead serious. Like he's like, I'm excited about these. I think they'll help with my blisters when I run. And I am like, so he's going to wear those inside running shoes and run. Yeah, he's going to wear. Th- yes, yes. And then that you're going to suck plan. on his sweaty toe sock toes. Absolutely not. And see, this is the thing. So I'm sorry if this is the first podcast you're listening to. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> but but Anoju toe sock lore has been a part of afternoon a podcast for like a year. Okay, so just like whatever and lee and i recently got in trouble for like really <laughs> going it, was a in would you, the- it was a would you rather it was scenario but this Look, is the thing i had to then clean i will put it in my mouth it's and then i had to explain to him because he's like i don't because he's like why are you freaking out and i was like i have to i have to message amy and leah right now and he's like why and i then so then i i had to explain anoju to neil and you know do you want to know how embarrassing that was? Because this is the thing. I wanted Anoju to remain in my like craven fantasies <laughs> to the grave. Like I never wanted <laughs> to have to explain to Neil what it is about Anoju <laughs> and his toes. That that has been such a hot topic on the pod. And I had to explain that to him. And it was it was horrifying and embarrassing. Were you like Neil? <laughs> I know you don't want me to touch your hair, and that's fine. <laughs> what I need you to do is just really slick it back to where, like, if you touched it, you were cracking it like a creme brulee. <laughs> Wear a heavy chain. A heavy chain. A low, <laughs> unbuttoned shirt. Yeah. Poke your tongue. Poke your tongue in your cheek when you talk, and make a noise that's kind of like the sticks uh, do in the dark crystal, <laughs> where it's like. <laughs> <laughs> And then, like, finger your toes in the toe socks. Kick off, oh. kick off your shoes, put them up on your desk. Oh, put them up on your desk. And just play little piggies with yourself. And then somehow, like, <laughs> I'm going to be fucking wet. Like, <laughs> see, no. If he did that, I'd be like, get. Let's think he liked, because then he, when he realized I was, like, freaking out, he kept, like, trying to touch me with them. And I was like, get away, get away. And he went out and bought new toe socks. And even in the package, he tried to touch me with them. And I was like, get away from me. 
<laughs> those toes. Oh my God, I wonder no. if I could get some fucking dirty going in my house. I hadn't even thought about that. Buy Nick some toe socks and maybe... <sighs> Be like, I will trim your eyebrows and put these on. It's- <laughs> we got to have some facial trimming right. for sure. <laughs> because, like, the problem is, is that, like, I mean, he's still cute. But, like, when he was younger, he was, like, very cute. And my he, children he just was. Yes. don't... He's a good man. I, he, he, yeah, he, I think don't... he's still... I had the biggest crush on Nick when, when like, we first met. Like, I, I never met Nick. But when we first met and you would post pictures of him, I was like, oh, my God. Can we... Can we... <laughs> we talked wife about swap? wife swapping. Oh, and we wanted I, to I mean, wife swap. Like, now I will with the toe stock thing. <laughs> yes. But I'm just saying that, like, my children now really dismiss him. Like, my son especially is, like, who does use face wash. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, like, this haggard old man who's my father, <laughs> like, who has, like, you know, like, his balls have, like, you know, evaporated and he's, like, <laughs> no longer, like, a full man, apparently. I just would be like, look, you trim some of those eyebrows and you're going to get it back, baby. You're yeah. get it back. Yeah. Just just a little retinol, little eye cream. Get a kahi stick. Smooth get a it kahi over. St- <laughs> <laughs> just... Your hands in like a little Vaseline pack. Right. <laughs> I've actually, I mean, I literally just got Neil to use suntan lotion on his face. Like sunscreen on his face. That's been the last suntan like two years. Suntan lotion? What? Suntan lotion? Well, suntan, that was, sunscreen. That was back, back in the day when you wanted to tan. Yeah, I was like, did you Really? I still call it suntan lotion. And, like, I call it sunblock. Because I want to keep it off. Oh, well, suntan lotion to me is sunscreen. I don't, I, 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 don't, I say things weird. I say sunblock. weird things. Suntan lotion sounds like you just bought a pack of snack wells. <laughs> it's like circa 1990. She's got her Hawaiian snack. tropics oil. Yeah. You're going to get <laughs> really? like a setter home, like Zinfandel. And so sun, so suntan there. lotion is like a different thing? Suntan lotion is not a thing at all. Unless like you're like hoping to cultivate. So I just like made up this term and I've been using no, it. So my whole no, life. I think other people say it. I think other people say it, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. I feel like some emotions <laughs> like you're putting on to like hope to get the suntan. You got okay, that reference. Suns- I did get that reference. Yes, everyone. I watched The Princess Bride. You can all clap oh, yeah, wait, for wait, me. Wait, wait. We got to hear about that fast. We are at 17 minutes <clears throat> in, but. Okay. Um, well, no, I made it. So this was the funny thing because my daughter's like, I don't want to watch it. She's like very like anti princess right now. She just was like, she's too cool for princesses. And it's not that kind so, of princess movie. I know, I know. So I, I was like, you know what? Text your best friend. Ask her if she's seen the Princess Bride. She texted her best friend. Her best friend wrote back in all caps. Oh my god, me and my mom love that movie. So I was like, have your friend up, and we're all gonna sit and watch the Princess Bride. So we did. Um, it was like me, Neil. Um, with his unwashed face and my son and my daughter and her friend. And so we all watched it. And I mean, I laughed a lot. I thought it was, I like camp. I'll, like, I love camp. 80s camp is one of my favorite um, genres, to be honest. And so, yeah, it was like full 80s camp. And like Neil, I wouldn't say like, it's definitely not Neil's movie, but he got like, he understood what, what it was. Like he got 80s camp. He was like, okay, like I, I get what they were trying to do. And we kind of had to explain that to my son because he didn't like, get it do you know what i mean he didn't like get 80s camp um but uh yeah like i said i i liked it a lot i think if i would have like watched it when i was younger and then also like grown up with like the pop culture of it i would like it a lot of course more. that makes um, sense that's fair yeah but i mean i like i i cracked up like numerous times like andre the giant was great i loved it i you know i loved the characters it was it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun so now i can say i watched it everyone Get off my fucking back. <laughs> Except they don't know they don't know that you oh. haven't watched Star Wars. Well, no, Neil was like, I'm not watching Star Wars with you. I'll watch The Princess Bride. I'm not watching. What do you mean he's not gonna watch Star Wars? Oh, he was like, Hell no, I'm not watching that. Watch it with <laughs> watch it with Dane and Hazel. Just do it for them because I'll try. you're doing them I'll a service. Try. I will try, but Dane we tried to get him to watch it before and he didn't he was like uninterested. So I'll try. I will try. I don't know. My family's weird. I don't know what to tell you. Just put on some suntan lotion and get on the couch and watch it. <laughs> With a, with a gyro. <laughs> with a gyro. God. <laughs> and talking before the pod about how, like in my state, I don't think anyone knows how to prop. I mean, everyone says gyro. <laughs> well, Unless you're like actually Greek. 
as we begin to move into our pod, I don't know. Right. I'm going to give you guys a challenge to segue out of this. My my dot because do you know what's become like hot like aesthetically for the early teen demo is Y2K. So my daughter's like, Mom, how old were you for Y2K? And I'm like, mm, like 1920. And she's like, what was your style for Y2K? I'm like, Y2K, like 99, 2000. <laughs> and she's like, like, yeah. what? like, what was your style? <laughs> I was like, um, low cut jeans and a tight shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess. And my hair twisted in rows to look like I was like Gwen Stefani. I yeah. did chokers. I did chokers. Yeah. Chokers. Low rise jeans. So Those like Steve I mean. Madden platform black yes. sandals. Oh. oh my God. The slides, the platform slides. Yeah. yeah. Those that. are the best. <laughs> Everyone had those. Slides. Those are, okay. So not, it's, it's cyclical. Those are back. Like, well, that's what, cause she's trying to see this is the thing is they want the, they want the Y2K aesthetic. She's trying to like mine me for like what's the Y2K aesthetic because that's what she wants to like be doing at the moment. Really? I didn't know that was like a thing. Oh, it's a big thing. But I wow. think that's all, like okay. I said, I think that's all coming back. Like you, you look like on any like Gap, Old Navy, like any website, they have 90 style jeans now. They call them like 90s low rise, mm-hmm. loose fitting jeans. And stop with the low rise. No one wants low oh, rise. Oh, I wear back. low rise still because I have zero torso. And so if I oh. wear high rise jeans, it goes boobs and then top of my jeans. Oh, well, I mean, me too, but I still like, it. Ugh, I don't, I, I need, I need, cause I have big boobs too. So I need to look like I have a torso. True. I get it. And I, I don't, <laughs> you don't want to just be head boobs, head, and, boobs and, head boobs and then like the button of my jeans. <laughs> All right. So am I flying out from head boobs, butt to what Yeah, you know talking. who doesn't wear low rise jeans? <laughs> <laughs> but could, but could. he could he could rock some low-rise jeans but I, mm-hmm. he I'm, i guarantee you no low-rise flares for this guy mm. right and that is mm-hmm. our man sung dong il sung dong il okay so sung dong il is a south korean actor and comedian known widely for his fantastic comedic timing and wit and he started his career in theater but made a transition into doing variety shows and television series and has dabbled in movies and has really become honestly, probably one of the most prominent supporting actors in the entertainment industry. And, you know, just this year, no, just last year, cause it's 2022. I still don't know what year it is. He was nominated for two KBS drama awards, curtain call, and then If You Wish Upon Me, winning for If You Wish Upon Me. He has also won acting awards for drama such as the very, very popular Reply series, It's Okay, That's Love, The Legend of the Blue Sea, and the movie Take Off. So we're going to go through some fun facts just to kick it off about Song Jong Il, pulled from a website that I thought was just hilariously called thefamouspeople.com. <laughs> Sounds very yeah, reputable. Yeah, totally reputable. I was like, this is hard hitting journalism <laughs> at its finest. <laughs> so, why don't you go through, uh, Megan, Amy, take a couple dot points and give us just like a little like setup to some of the backstory of Song Dong Il before we get into like his acting time. Okay. Well, what I think is awesome is that we're recording this pod uh, in time for his upcoming birthday, which is. April 27th. So Sung Dong Il was born in Incheon, South Korea on the 27th of April, 1967. And according to him, he was born into a strict household that had many rules and restrictions. His parents were quite orthodox in their beliefs, but couldn't stop their son from dreaming big. He always had an impeccable sense of humor, which he exhibited perfectly among his schoolmates and family members. But making a career out of it was a thought far away from his mind. He originally planned a career in engineering, and acting was just a fun hobby in school. He enrolled in the Yuhan University's mechanical design program, but somehow he never gave up on acting and kept participating in local theaters. He considered this uh, just a leisure activity, and the routine continued until 1987 when he ventured into professional theater. His reputation grew further, and when he gave a shot at the SBS Open Talent Auditions in 1991, he was one of the very few who succeeded. And hence, a career in acting began. 
All right. So look, I always really just love stories where a person takes a more traditional career path and kind of embarks on that, but ends up really getting veered towards the more creative work side of the house. So I think the three of us have pretty similar journeys in that. And so I guess just to like kick things off, like, can you just give a short TLDR version of, you know, we don't need like a whole story of Riddick, Megan, <laughs> but how you ended up being an author. <laughs> or Peaky Blinders. <laughs> Shut up. Peaky <laughs> Blinders is always fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, uh, I went to college and became a high school English teacher. And for over a decade... I was teaching before I started writing and I began writing because of a program that we had at my school that I've mentioned on the pod before um, called Writer's Week at, at Fremd High School. Um, and it's basically a week celebrating writing where students get up and read their own writing. Teachers get up and read their own writing. We, you know, we brought in professional writers from outside and basically it was seeing my students get up there and like read their own creative work that I was like, well, shit, I got to practice what I preach. And I'm like, if they can do it, so can I. And I just kind of like found this writing contest for teachers where it challenged you to write the first chapter of a book. And I wrote that first chapter. And then I just kept writing and wrote the whole book. Um, it's not published, but <laughs> but that's how I wrote my first book. And that's how I went, you know, once I realized that I could, I wanted to keep doing it. Um. Yeah, so I was always like a writer all through school. It was really the only subject I was good at. <laughs> um, but I was always told, like, you can't make money through writing. So uh, I, the only profession that I could do was journalism. So I went to school for journalism. Um, and I was a reporter and was not good at it, frankly. Uh, it was very stressful and exhausting and, like, just not me, basically. Um, I left... Um, because I was unhappy and depressed. I uh, worked for my brother as an insurance agent for a little bit. And then I always knew I wanted to write. And that whole time I was kind of like cultivating an idea. I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to like, because that was also when like self-publishing was making like a boom um, on Amazon. And uh, when I got pregnant, I uh, left my job. And my son was like a baby when I got this story idea. And I actually went and got a tattoo. And it's a uh, ink bottle with a feather quill on my ribs. And it says Carpe Diem. I know I'm so like basic cliche. <laughs> I'm so basic. Um, <laughs> so, so, so white girl basic. And um, but that was like, I was like, that was my call. Like I was like, it's there on my body. Like I, I gotta just do my dream that I've always wanted to do. And uh, yeah, I wrote like my first book, like a month later. Well, like I started writing it a month later and um, yeah, eventually got an agent and that whole thing. But that, I mean, yeah, it was like a roundabout way, but it was like definitely always my dream. So really quickly, I was a creative writing major in college. I liked poetry a whole lot. I did a lot of poetry stuff. I realized that like, I didn't want to be an academic and I also didn't see like a super practical path forward with poetry. So I started working in nonprofit, had a good time with that. But I remember I had my first child and I was walking in the desert. I was in my late twenties and I was with my husband and he was like, you know what? Someday, like, you know how you used to want to write a lot. Maybe like when you retire someday, that could be like a thing for you. And that sounded so fucking shitty to me at the time. Like I was like still in my late twenties. I had this like baby strapped to me and I was like, wait, like the idea of me writing, like seriously, like not just like, you know, I'd done some like poetries and like journals and stuff like that. But I was like, hang on, this doesn't sound great. So I kind of like filed that away. And then I had my second baby. And at that point I became like a full-time stay at home mom. And anyone who's ever been a stay at home mom, like hats off to you. I, did it. I did it. I did it for years. And I did not love it. <laughs> Same. I hated it. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, it was not it, like I didn't wake up every morning. Like, I mean, the first time, like the first year with my son, I like 
remember i think i've told you guys i like made laundry soap by hand like i made my own laundry soap like i i took the kool-aid of like domesticity and was like well i'm gonna like fucking like you know that was like the beginning of like the mommy blog stage i was like yeah yes i am into it like you want me to do all the crazy shit i'm gonna do all the crazy shit we're not gonna Mm -hmm. do sugar we're not gonna do tv like we're just and then i was like fuck this lie that i'm being (laughs) sold (laughs) And right. so when I had my second kid, all of a sudden I was like, look, I've got time. Well, I don't have time, but I need I need some time for me. And so my TLDR is that I was like, I don't have another, like, I have to do this job. But if I just do this job, I'm going to yeet myself into the ocean, like, at any point. <laughs> so I need something else to do. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to try to write a fucking book. Like, I'm not even going to try. I am going to write a book it's just for fun. And so I spent a year writing a historical romance set on a convict ship between England and Australia. It is not good, but I wrote a whole book. And at the end, I was like, I fucking wrote a book. And then all of a sudden, like, I was able to get an agent from that book. I actually sold that book, although thank God I did not really sell it because I'm really happy no one's ever read it. But that's what started me was I was just like at home and look, I love my kids and I don't feel like I need to justify that. Like I love my kids. I like being a mom, being a stay at home mom for me was very hard. And when I finally went back to quote, quote office work, I remember my first day I was like, this is a fucking scam that people go to these places and act like this is hard when I can like pee and drink <laughs> coffee like fuck this <laughs> I was like I can get a snack whenever I want I can check my email whenever I want this I is fucking great I was like is this a joke like I just the hang in here like, I know, this is a I know. and so <laughs> yeah so anyway that, that was the why and I was like no, I got to write a book. So I did oh, not so funny. myself into the ocean and I wrote a book. We did it. Did it. Okay. So next question. Despite showing up in many, 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 many key dramas, so much so that he's getting his own appreciation episode from us today. Sung Dong Il's first drama, 200 Pound Love, came out in 2006. That's wow. 17 years ago, which, you know, in like, romance writing years or k-drama years is a long time but he was 39 when he did that so this means that basically the actor that many of us know and love really stepped into these like commercial k-drama roles in his middle age and as someone in their motive as someone in their 40s and i personally find that very motivating so as of this year we're all officially in our 40s welcome megan <laughs> And creatively, I don't know about y'all, but I don't feel anywhere close to tapped out. So what is something that you would love to creatively challenge yourself with during this decade? So I I also want to say that I um, wrote my first book when I was 37. So hats off to, you know, figuring out that creative dream later in life, like not too late, never too late. Song Dong Il starting when he's 39. Fucking awesome. Um, So yeah, I mean, like, You know, writing's hard and getting to write what you want is hard. Um, And I think I've talked about this more than once on the podcast, but I I do want to write other things. And I really, I do want to write a vampire story at some point. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever make it happen, but Leah and I have talked about this too, like way back when we used to be really into CW shows. Like I would love to write for television or movies. I would love to write a screenplay, something like that. Turn one of my books into i don't know it's on my vision board book is a movie um yeah and and so i mean i want to see where this podcast can go this was like we did this on a total whim and look where we are you know more than two years later and i want to use whatever creative energy i have to just keep growing this community that we have yeah um so i want to write like more of a like a women's fiction type uh, paranormal, like a like a long full length something I can give to my agent and be like sell this to a traditional publisher. So I've I've now self published for a long time and I love it, but um, I still just have a goal of of um, kind of like a non romance book, 
you know, I'm going to have romantic elements. I'm me, but that's, that's my goal. Um, I've always, oh my God, I've always wanted to write a screenplay. Can you imagine? Oh. And then I would say the same thing. Like, look, I love this pod so much and I love our listeners. Like, this is, this is like, I, I'm admitting out loud, but this is like a long-term goal. Like, I, I'm talking, I want to do like a tour. I want to like do like an afternoon tour where we go to cities and we visit our listeners. Like that, that is like a long-term like goal Like live mine. shows, and, like other podcasts yeah, do. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. I want to, I want to do live shows because I want to like meet you all. And I want to be able to like sit there and interact with you in person so badly like that is a huge huge goal of mine it's i like from the very beginning when i realized that we had kind of done something (laughs) with this pod uh, that's always been a goal i love that i'm down well i went to see um uh oh gosh before covid and everything i went to see my favorite murder in philadelphia the the ladies who host that had this like live show in philly and i went with my best friend and it was truly such a fun night like and it was uh, yeah it was like a magical moment um to go and like be in this community of people where you like you're like you all get the jokes because you're like you're all listening to this pod you all you know and you're all wearing like t-shirts and with the quotes from the oh i just love i've done it i've done it twice i did armchair expert and i did how did this get made and oh i would love to go to oh it was it's so it's just so much fun and i mean like I love interacting with our listeners, you know, on social media and in Patreon and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, like the face to face, I mean, even if, you know, even if it was like an audience type setting, like, but like the face to face, like when we do our our lives or our Patreon, that's just such a cool feeling because we know we have this little community out there and we love you all, but to be able to be with you is, is pretty special. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. I feel like a lot. Uh, one thing is that I think that what it's really struck me, I think, in doing this podcast, especially, has been this idea that I feel like as you get a little bit older, like how you interact with people and meet people really shifts and changes and not necessarily always for the good. So it could be like you start to just like relate to people who are in your job because like you're seeing people at work or you might see people if you have kids through like, you know, oh, you're like parent friends, I'm going to friend you. But like friending over like common interests and, you know, connecting like that isn't necessarily like always the norm. And recently at work, we did this whole training that was on um, like the idea of like joy is like a subversive force in society. And at our table, it was like, have you, do you do anything that makes you feel joyful? And my table had no joy. Everyone's like, no, I have nothing that makes me feel like joy. That's so sad. (laughs) And I was like, I mean, I'm like under the table, like looking at sugar videos. Like, I feel like (laughs) joy. You're looking at pictures of Sugar's fingers. Oh my god! And like <laughs> yeah. doing like you know this space and just all these spaces. I'm like, I feel not that like my life is perfect by any stretch. Of course, it's not. But I was like, I don't feel like finding joy and happiness is like a problem for me right now. And right. so I just realized like, okay, I don't want to like MLM this and become like a weirdo about it. But I was like how can we be leveraging these spaces where like building community and making people feel like they're belonging and feeling like they can show up and be like, Hey, I like these things. And like fandom and linking to belonging, I think is just really a powerful space. So I don't know what exactly I want to do with that, but like in my forties, I want to like mine that more and figure out, especially for us in like the U S I'm like, it's 2023, 2024. We're moving into a presidential cycle. Like, fuck no. Like a hundred percent. I am not getting sucked back into like the bullshit that I lived in. in oh like, God. The I 2015 know. to 2020 oh, stage. That was a dark no, time. <laughs> I absolutely will not do that again. Yeah. And so figuring out places to say, do we still want to be upset and like want to work for justice? And like, I think this happens like globally, like we all need to like fight the fight but you got to be able to fill the bucket. And so whatever we yeah. can be doing in these spaces to help other people identify how they're going to fill the bucket, I think that's like where I want to be. And then for me, like personally and creatively, I just want to write, 
I feel like a lot of what I've written has been what I've been asked to be written. And I don't think I've ever like truly leaned into like the weird shit I like. And so I just want to really like write some stuff. That's just the weird shit. I love writing because I had to do that very much. And so I would like to do that in my forties as well. All right. So great. We've spoken into being. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So it. Put it out there into the universe. Yeah, And hopefully you have some things too, like as you're listening, like what are they going to be the things that like are going to like get you going? Mm-hmm. So this is something I thought was really sweet. But Song Dong Il is also known for being like a mentor and friend to younger actors, including being famously visited on the set of Collateral by BTS's V or Kim Tae Hyung and Park Bo Gum. And so, like, what's the attraction? Like, why would these guys, like, really seek out Sung Dong Il's company? And in an interview where clips of it were reposted to Korea Boo, Sung Dong Il had a lot of thoughts about this. So one was he said, rather than meeting up with them to talk about me, I listen to what they have to say. And I think they like that. And he went on to say, I listen to my Hubei's talk because I'm curious. But we never talk about acting. I don't try to teach them what acting is. I ask them what they want to eat. They tell me. We joke around and talk about fun stuff, and then we go home. The kids think it's probably fun because an old Sunbei is listening to them talk. I think that's it. Nothing special. I just listen to them. And I know that he says, oh, it's like nothing special. But getting somebody who has clearly life experience and has done a, a lot and has had success, and they're just listening to you and giving you time. And they're not trying to tell you what to do. They're not trying to solve your life. They're not trying to like pontificate about whatever. They're just there to like listen and kind of hang out. Like that's a really powerful thing to have. So that also got me to think like, has an older mentor ever listened to you? And I mean like really listen to you as well as interact in some sort of like low drama, but supportive way. And what was that experience like and how did it influence you? So this is going back to my my teacher years. Um, and I've, I mean, I've already mentioned, you know, like my school inspiring me to write. And there were definitely some some mentors in my uh, English department there who were part of that. But this is like, this sounds like kind of like a simple, silly little thing, but it meant a lot to me. And it, and it shaped my career um, in education. And it was um, a teacher uh, who was initially my first like department head, like he was the guy who hired me. And then um, after a few years, he wanted to spend more time in the classroom. So he stepped down from, you know, managing the, the English department and was still teaching and stuff like that. And I just loved hearing about what was going on in his classroom, because I knew his students loved his class. And I knew that he had this great rapport with them. And I was like, you know, this total newbie and had no idea what I was doing. And I think I asked if I could just go like sit in on his class one day and just observe like during one of my free periods. And somehow from that was born. And I don't know if it was that I saw him doing it, or we ended up talking about it. But, you know, while I haven't always been a writer, I've always been a reader and books are very important to me, whether I'm reading them or writing them and and books in kids hands is very important to me and connecting with people over reading. And he was doing independent reading in his classroom. Like, we were kind of lucky in that we had 50 minute class periods. It's a pretty good chunk of time in a high school. And he would take time out in the beginning of class, like if he if he had it to give and give the kids like 10 minutes of free independent reading and they could bring in their own books or he had like a box of books. And from that grew a group of us in our department who started building classroom libraries. And I taught AP literature. So I was teaching a lot of classic stuff, a lot of, you know, really um, deep and meaningful books, which I liked, uh, you know, stuff that stuff that was deemed worthy for the AP test so that you could write it about on the on the AP test. But if I wasn't giving any sort of you know assessment to my classroom that I needed the whole class period for, I gave my kids independent reading time the first 10 minutes of class every day. And I started building this classroom library to the extent where I had like hundreds of books. And I know my friends who are still at that school have like walls of books now, like hundreds and hundreds of books that, that they let their kids use. And honestly, what I remember the most from my 13 years of teaching at that school um, is not anything that showed up on an AP test, even though I'm not dissing the AP test, like it helps a lot of kids. But what what sticks out to me the most is the way that I connected with students 
in those first 10 minutes, like if somebody had just finished a book, would come in and want to talk to me about it, or they just read something that they know I read. And so they're like, what did you think of this? And I don't, I mean, it sounds, you know, maybe cool to some of you and maybe super silly to some of you, but that was some of my best teaching moments. And I got that from just being able to be in a space where somebody I admired was working. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I would say I've met a lot of authors uh, who don't listen. <laughs> a lot of a lot of authors that have been in mentor spaces who um, I don't think they've actually heard me when we've been in like a one on one um, conversation. But then there are also some who do, and I guess just because. I've had both. I like know the difference. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I went, I had to go to a conference to present um, one year and it was um, like a really, really rough point in my writing career. I didn't even really want to be there, but I'd already committed. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't want to cancel, um, but it was really hard. And so uh, I was at, uh, I sat down at the bar with, um, an author who I've always admired. Her name is Zoe York. And she also writes um, like a whole, she has like a whole series of essentially like how to start a successful series. Like she talks straight, like this is how you start a successful romance series. This is how you market it. Like uh, it's, it's a really great series of books that I love and I have in paperback and I've read. And I sat down with her at the bar and, you know, like I said, I've talked to a lot of authors who, love to just talk about themselves. And it was really surprising that she was just not like that. And she wanted to hear about me and she wanted to hear about what I was doing. And she asked a lot of questions and she would throw in some advice here and there, but she mostly just listened to me. Uh, we sat at that bar for like an hour and a half and it meant so much to me. And every time that I've seen her after that, I just saw her at a signing last year. Same thing. Just, well, how are you, Megan? What's going on with you? How are things, you know, and like, I would try to turn it around on her, but like, she's just that type of person that um, I think she enjoys being a mentor. I think she enjoys being someone that will listen to others and just like be that, that person. And um, yeah, she means a lot to me. She helped me a lot when I was not doing well. And yeah, I really owe it to her. She's a great writer too. If you ever want to check out her book, Zoe York. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, and I know what you're saying. Like, it's also like a weird, uh, yeah, sometimes like I just wish that in the past, I've definitely had times where like being a baby author, I wish there was like less ego and more just like friendliness. Yes. That's a better way to say. Yeah. I, maybe I was avoiding the word ego, but yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, something that was powerful was when I was in my early twenties, I got a job in a weird part of my life where, I was trying to find, um, I was trying to like really get going. Like I'd been really ambitious in college and then had kind of like followed my heart to Australia and was with my husband. He was my, still my boyfriend, but was like serious. And I knew that was like kind of like an end game for me, but he was really focused in his career and really dedicated to his path. And it meant that I had to like take a lot of my own personal time to make that work. Cause I was like having to like move across the world and it's not always easy to find a job in another country that like makes, that's like not being a nanny. And so I had gone back to my parents' house and was trying to keep my husband, my boyfriend at the time was doing field work in the Antarctic. And I was like, you know, trying to be like, okay, I got to figure out what I'm going to do and start to like think about my goals and I ended up getting an internship for a news station in Minnesota, Care 11 News. And I worked at the state capitol. I used to work in politics a lot. And my reporter that I worked for, I basically was an assistant to a reporter. Um, and they were amazing to me. And I felt as if it was really cool because they were, you know, a TV reporter. Um, they were an author. And they were really smart and they had good takes on things and they were never competitive or weird to me. They just used their time to kind of like talk about the industry. They would trust me to do like random stuff, like 
go do like deep research into things, go take this mic and like get the governor's statement on something. I was not a journalist. I had no experience in any of it. And so I'd like be there in the pool with like all the other like folks from like NPR and stuff, like holding a mic being like, I got to get like the thing. And now they work in um, Minnesota public radio and I'm just proud of them for their success. But also they were just always very, Like I worked with them for six to eight months and I just felt like, yes, it was never competitive. It never felt like they were gatekeeping anything. And they were always just like, you were need to focus on you. You need to focus on your vision. You need to figure out like, what does success mean to you? And that just always meant a lot. I love that. I would say, yeah, gatekeeping and publishing is a thing too, where, you know, authors just don't want to share. So yeah, it's rough. So Song Dong Il has jokingly shipped the Love in the Moonlight star, and I love Love in the Moonlight for anyone looking for drama. Love in the Moonlight star, Kim Yoo Jung, with his son, June, who's seven years younger than her. If you could ship a K-drama actor or actress with one of your bebes to join your family, who would it be? This made me come to a really frightening realization today. Um, because I was trying, like, I was like, ooh, I'm like seven years. Like, I'm like, okay, so somebody seven years is going to be like pretty young. It won't be somebody that I'm like super attracted to because my floor does not go that low. And just for shits and giggles, because we're all watching <laughs> Alchemy of Souls right now and fucking loving it. And I've realized that my sexuality is a man who can wield a sword, especially if it's a magical sword. And I don't mean like his dong, like I mean a sword. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if his dong works, too, even better. But, like, man with a sword, sexy. Okay, the King Eternal Monarch, and now Alchemy of Souls. So I was, um, you know, like I said, just for fun, I was like, well, how old is my sexy EJ Wook on Alchemy of Souls? He's 24. Oh, no. Which is seven years older than my daughter. (laughs) Oh my god. <laughs> Closer to your daughter's age than yours. Uh, that is yeah. heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. <laughs> Literally <laughs> half my age. Oh no. Oh no. I hate it. Oh <laughs> fucking damn you, Alchemy of Souls. It's bad. It's, it's like so bad stuff. because jeez. So I suppose I can have him as my son in law and just I'll drink the chaste tea so my thoughts behave. Oh, my God. Have you guys gotten to the chaste tea part? No. Okay, then you don't even know what I'm talking about. (laughs) It's okay. I mean, I I get the drift. (laughs) It's basically to be a totally focused mage. Right. Okay. You turn off your libido. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I love betrothing my son to my friend's kids. Uh, He has, like, three fiancés right now, including Leah's daughter. (laughs) Yes. And he's twelve. What's this competition we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, he has he has a lot, and he is like, oh my god! And right now there's like girl drama at school. I can't even tell you. I got a call from the guidance counselor about it. It's like, what is going on? He's twelve years old. Uh, anyway, so what's another fiance? So I am going to ship him with O.G. Yul, who played our adorable Yi Soul in The Glory. Like, she's only four years younger. Doesn't she have so a I, boyfriend? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I posted this on our Instagram because this cracks me up that she's like, I have a boyfriend and he's very good in Taekwondo. And it's like the cutest thing ever. But yeah, once they're adults, though, um, I think she will... You know, really, she's confident enough to kind of, like, bring him out of his shell. And, like, she is so stinking cute. She is. She She is so... I've seen her on a couple, like, variety shows, sort of. And she... uh, Extremely precocious. Like, love her to death. And for me, I ship my middle child with Kim Kong-hoon. He's 13. And she's nearly 13. And so, you know, they have a few years to let it bake before they're off to the claw machines. Oh, my God. He's so cute. And so, yeah, this actor knocked it out for me as the young Eugene and Mr. Sunshine, mm. as well as the kid with sad daddy issues and when the camellia blew. Oh, Pilgu. Pilgu, yes. He's, He's also great. in Rocket Boys. But look, yeah, I mean, like, just that shout out to whenever I mention the when the camellia blooms, Big Drone Energy is one of the classic moments in television history. Yep. Okay, so I took this to the Patreon. Before we get to our K-Drama Wreck of the Week, 
Um, I asked Patri our Patreon, you know, that we are going to be doing a Sung Dong Il shout out today. And did anyone want to share like anything about their favorite Sung Dong Il performances and why? So I'm just going to like with no particular order or reason, and I'm not going to do all of them because there's a lot. I'm just going to pick a few. So we have Heather saying, I've only seen him in If You Wish Upon Me, but oh, what a guy. He made everyone he spoke to feel seen and loved, even when they didn't love themselves. So good. Oh, that's putting it so perfect, perfectly for Tashik yeah. in it If is. You Wish Upon Me. Oh. So Jamie said he was a great villain in Legend of the Blue Sea. Yes. That's. Um, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> and then we have Becky. I love how he so often plays heartfelt characters that are wise, but with a side of sass. He was one of my favorites in Hrong for this. Sneaky, sneaky. And that combo shows up too in If You Wish Upon Me and Reply 1988, although in very different ways. Oh, here's another one, which is as great as he was in the Reply series. I have to say, I thought he was brilliant in My Girlfriend is a Gumio. Um, and that he really committed to the role. Uh, there's a lot of love for him in Reply 1988 and If You Wish Upon Me. Um, I just feel like that is probably like the most. And then I'm just trying to see if I can see any. Oh, somebody says that they want to shout out his signature dry chuckle. His quiet <laughs> little hit, hit, hit. Yeah, I could totally <laughs> hear it. Yep. Yeah. And then last one I'm just going to call from is Ashley, who said, I'm adding my vote for If You Wish Upon Me, but Hospital Playlist was the drama that first made me notice him. He was so good in every scene he was in, even though it wasn't many. And I love how he can make you laugh or cry with seemingly little effort. Remember, because he was the priest. Yes, in the priest brother. The, yeah. Priest brother to um, Cinnamon Roll. Uh, An Jung Wan. Yeah, A Jung Wan. I wanted to say Andreas, because that was his... Well, they called know, him Andrea, because his name sounds like Andre An Jung Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, and he was a fantastic priest in that. Just like, I love a cool priest. All right. So K-pop wreck of the week this week, Megan. You've got some big feelings here. Yes, I am so excited. So Zykers, which is spelled X-I-K-E-R-S, um, have debuted. And so, look, I've had my eye on them for a while. They are the debut group of kq entertainment which is where ats is uh where ats is and everyone knows i love ats so this is this is their this is their who base and so um and i also saw them um when i saw ats in newark um this year uh psychers of course at the time they didn't have like their name but they performed a few songs on stage so i saw them in person and they were amazing and so now to like see them debut has just been like really heartwarming for me and um i love their album um and i ordered like signed albums and they're so fun they open like a pizza box and they have so many so many fun goodies inside my daughter and i opened them together and it was really fun to like do it with her and she's been practicing all their names because there's 10 of them um so yeah it's just it's great and so they're single um they kind of like double title tracks but i'm gonna recommend tricky house for their debut track they also have um just like ats they have lore and so their lore has to do with their like boys lost in like time and they have to find coordinates to reach their dreams um yeah it's like the lore is a lot but That's it's fun. okay i still yeah and um goblins have to do with their lore as well they talk about dokabies a lot uh we don't quite know yet how goblins fit in but that is also part of their lore so it's just a lot of fun i love them i already have biases so yeah check out psychers uh their song tricky house if you enjoy our podcast you have our patrons to thank at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom. 
because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoon A Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop Rex, blow up your skin with K-merch Rex, find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. So what kinds of things do you both like to do when you drive? Pay attention to the road? Is this a trick question? All right, how about when you fold laundry? Why am I folding laundry in this scenario? Read, friends. I was trying to get you to say read. You could just ask us if we like to read when we drive or... Wait, how are you reading when you're driving? With Audible. You know, our sponsor, who is the leading creator and provider of premium audio storytelling, enriching the lives of millions of listeners every day. I listen to audiobooks on my commute to work in the car. Oh, yeah. I totally do that. I love my Audible subscription. Then why'd you leave me hanging with the whole driving thing? Forget it. It's not important. What is important is that now our listeners can get a 30-day free trial of Audible Premium Plus from Afternoon of Delight. Do you know what they get with that free trial? Actually, I do. They get one audiobook credit, two if they are Prime members, which is good for any premium selection, and they get to keep that audiobook. They also get the whole Audible Plus catalog of podcasts, like Afternoon of Delight, audiobooks, guided wellness, and Audible originals. And with the Plus catalog, you can listen all you want, no credits needed. And Audible sends you a reminder email before your trial ends. Sounds like a great way to spend 30 days to me, especially if you're heading outside for a walk, have a long commute to work, or just want to hear one of many talented narrators really bring your book to life. All you have to do is go to www.audibletrial.com slash afternoona to sign up and you're ready to download your first listen. Enjoy! And just as a side note, this is going back a little bit, but like before I first watched Goblin and Leah was watching Goblin and she's talking about how awesome the show is, Goblin. The Western definition of Goblin has a very different visual than from Gong, what I see in Gong Yu. And so I remember when I was first getting ready to watch Goblin, I thought he was going to be like this grotesque monster <laughs> and yeah, not no, be Gong Yu. Gonna... Yeah. <laughs> I know, so right? I much prefer the Dokebi version of a Goblin than I do our version of it. I mean, same nine-tailed foxes are all hot. Right. Like, you know, same with aliens, except for wearing a towel while they shower. They're pretty hot. Right. They're pretty hot. They just don't understand... <laughs> shower manners or whatever <laughs> shower etiquette yeah so <laughs> what was the first drama that you saw song dong il in and how did that shape your first impression of him so this is why i love that we have people in the patreon talking about legend of the blue sea because that was the first thing i saw him in was legend of the blue sea and i'm the only one on the pod who's seen that drama because that was when i watched like four uh Eamon Ho dramas in like a weekend. So he plays a villain in two different time periods because there's like reincarnation and stuff like that. And uh, in the present day, he's a freaking serial killer, <laughs> like this creepy, creepy serial killer. And I didn't know him like from anything. And then I wa then like I watch Reply 1988. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is happening here? Um, and I've come to find that he is much more often playing a character like he does in in the Reply series than uh, than the serial killer. But he was a he was a really good serial killer. I mean, I had to look back through Asian Wiki to try to figure out what drama was the first that I saw him in, and like his career is crazy. He's been in like everything. 
Right. He's probably in stuff that you don't even remember that you saw him in. I know. And he's also been in a ton of movies. I didn't realize he's been in that many movies. Either. Yeah. I mean, a his lot, movie list was lot. big. Yeah. So I think I think that I first saw him in Reply 1988. But I feel like that's not right. Like, I feel like I've seen him. You know what I mean? I, it's so hard. Because he's also been in, like, just so much else. Because he was in Prison Playbook. He played, actually, that was almost like a cameo. Because he was only in, like, the beginning. I don't know if you remember. And he was, like, the, like, corrupt cop. Mm-hmm. Which he was so good as a corrupt cop, too. He was great. And then, like, I feel like If You Wish Upon Me was when I, like, like, I guess he was in Reply 1988. That was, like, a huge cast. and Whatever. If you wish upon me was like I felt like that was like about him. Like he almost shared the title role Absolutely. with Ji Chang Wook. And so that was when I was like, oh, wait, like okay, this is the guy who's been in everything, but like now he's like getting to really be like front and center. Um yeah, and I had to look back at his whole list and I think I'm not positive, but I think it's either Midnight Runners or Moon Lovers. Scarlet Heart Ryo. And I think it's Moon Lovers. Because remember, I watched it first so long ago. So you watched that before watched- Apply? Moon Lovers? Yes. Okay. And he's the grand general of this truly badass princess character. And I'm talking this girl wears like bear skins and fights like a demon. And he becomes the father-in-law to uh, Baek Hyun of EXO fame. <laughs> but look, the thing is, is I was fighting for survival in that hot mess of eye candy because Moon Lovers is just like, it's a mess, but it's a hot mess. <laughs> and that I'm going to defend to my dying day. So he was in it and he was great. <laughs> but he didn't take my whole ass until the Reply series. <laughs> And so what's one trait about Sung Dong Il's performances that you enjoy? So aside from him, like, playing a serial killer, <laughs> I feel like he, like, in his characters, has this uncanny knack of making you trust him, even if it's a flawed char- character. You know, like, I'm thinking more of, like, If You Wish Upon Me and, you know, Reply 1988 than I am, you know, Legend of the Blue Sea. And I think that's maybe his smile, like, you know, somebody mentioned his laugh, but I really like his smile, which he doesn't offer freely in the roles that he plays. And there's something about that crinkly eyed grin with like a couple of crooked teeth that just makes it feel so real and genuine. And I feel like a character who gets a Song Dong Il smile directed their way is someone special. Aww. So I I actually think he has this like edge to him that makes him able to play roles where he's lovable, but also ones where he can be kind of like a total evil jerk and it's believable both ways. Like, I think there are some characters who are like, they're just so sunshiny odysseys that like, I can't see them as that they could like be anything bad, but he just has this something about him where I'm not always sure. Like I I will say when I first started watching, if you wish upon me, I actually was like, is he going to end up being sort of like a villain role? Cause they were kind of teasing. Like he had this like, this like mysterious backstory and i was kind of like he can like i was like he could totally be like a villain like i i don't know where this is gonna go i mean he he isn't but um he ends up being like amazing lovable mentor but i wasn't sure because i know he's capable of whatever he would have been a better villain than the villain (laughs) in wish if you wish upon me (laughs) oh yeah i mean yeah so look i have a lot to say but my I put one trait, so I'm trying to stick with that. And I was really endeared with how he made that, like, cheek cheek pop sound in reference to drinking soju in Reply 1988. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. I was obsessed with it. But, you know, that was really short, so I feel like I can break my own rule. And this isn't a spoiler, but it's a reference to near the end of Reply 1988. And it has to deal with a series of encounters he has with his eldest child that I found brilliant because I feel like he captures to a T the struggle of a man who feels deeply, but he doesn't have the emotional intelligence to have a wholehearted conversation with his daughter. And so instead I feel like we get this mix of annoyance and anger and awkward affection that feels highly relatable to me as someone who has a family, especially extended family, that has like the same kind of processing challenges. 
Ugh, I love that because you're right. I how, it's so good. Man. You're bringing it all back. <sighs> I was I messy cry when I watch his role, like he and Bora at the end of Reply 1988. You would you would messy cry if you watched If You Wish Upon Me. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Oh, oh, I messy cried through like the whole oh, thing. Like, I, I still need to watch it. I really do need to there, watch it. I do think you would there, like it. There is some like over the top ridiculous stuff, but the mm. emotion of it makes it 100% worth it. It's, uh, yeah, I was like ugly cry, like heaving and like messaging Megan, like, what the fuck did you make me watch? <laughs> Seriously, I was doing the same. It was, and I was crying in the first episode. I was like, how am I crying in episode one? Like, what? You know, when it gets stuff gets you, it gets you. Okay, so I guess I'll add that to my list of this question, which is yeah. one of which is one of his dramas that you haven't seen and keep meaning to watch. So I was, you know, I had to go through his list, right? And so I, I do want to watch the other replies, um, although oh, he shows up in a smaller that. capacity in those, right? Mm, I mean. Yes and no. I mean, he's still really integral. Okay. Well, and I want to. F- you know, I started it, but then because we got into stuff with the pod, I still haven't finished Warong, and he is oh. such a fun character. That's one of those where you're like, is he good? Is he bad? He's kind of manipulative and menacing, which is fun, but he's also, like, doing it for a person that you want him to be doing it for. Like, it's just, yeah, he's so, he's super fun in that. And I was really, really enjoying that drama. So that's, I think, next on my list of his to finish. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, finish Harang, and then look. I still want to watch the K two. Um, just I for the shower scene, I haven't. Well, I mean, I've seen the shower <laughs> scene, but I just I I love Ji Chang Wook, um, and he's in that apparently. So that's another one that I would like to see. And I mean, I maybe I guess we just need to do Harang because we all put that down. Yeah, but for me, I also want to do that's okay. It's love. It's a little bit older. It's two thousand fourteen. But uh, the main character has a series of mental health challenges, including OCD. And I think it's a love story between him and potentially like a psychiatric student, like somebody studying to become a psychiatrist, I think. And uh, Kong Hyo Jin is in it. Our yeah. lovely we do. from When the Camellia Blooms. We love her. Our Dong Bake. Yes. So what's a drama role of his that stands out for you and why? I, I mean, I think I've already said it. it. It's if you wish upon me like that. So far. I mean, I, I loved him in reply, but that's a little bit further in my memory. And if you wish upon me is super recent and he is like Megan said, like he it's he's the second lead or the first lead. Like you can't even tell like it's either him or Ji Ching Wook. It could be him. Um, and he has such an emotional journey and not just emotional in like what he goes through himself, but his relationships with everybody else in the drama and what a mentor and father figure he is to so many, not just Ji Chang Wook's character. Like I, yeah, I sobbed my heart out because of him. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be repetitive, but I have to say the same one because he was that impactful. in if you wish upon me and that drama itself, I, I loved it a lot. And um, I mean, <sighs> Kong Tae Shik, what a character yeah. really, truly. And for me, look, I've seen him in quite a bit, but I have not seen If You Wish Upon Me, but Reply 1988, I like all the replies, but how he plays, I mean, he, and he also plays his own name in all the roles, which is really yes, funny. And well, like everybody in those are their own names, like all the adults. Yeah, but I mean, he's, all in, the he's in all of, yeah, he's in all of the replies, though. As Dong Il. And, <laughs> yeah, and he, like, meets himself, like, in one of them, he, like... There's like the noise above and they go to complain and then they go up and it's like he meets himself, but it's like himself from another drama. But then he's the cousin of himself. And they're like, oh, my my gosh. Yeah, they really like lean into it. But Reply 1988, he's just, you know, we know he like loaned money to a friend. And so that's why like they're so impoverished is like he really like fucked up the family finances to like be like a helper which was like bad because his wife is like WTF like my family like we need that money and like my three kids need the money but at the same time like he comes good at the end but then we see him as like what does it mean to be you know I mean it's not that like I need the story of the man always but 
in his case, like I felt like it just hit me in like feels of what does it mean to be still really willing and able to contribute in your job meaningfully, but your job has decided that you're no longer necessary. So you get like mm-hmm. Volan retired mm-hmm. in your job. What does it mean to be dealing with kids who are going through like social movements that you do not understand, but you've come up through such a difficult time? yourself that like you're like you can't even hardly understand like they're fighting for like a justice where you're just trying to fight to survive and like put food on the table and just like that that like tension there he just handles it all really well and there's of course times it goes to slapstick and i don't love slapstick but it just works in this because sometimes you need a little slapstick especially when everything else can feel like the stakes are high like there's a little bit of levity so yeah i just think reply 1988 it's all still in my top three top favorite dramas and i feel like he is a big reason for that so i just love him so much i agree but that being said are there any dramas you've seen him in that overall ended up being a miss maybe through no fault of his own not yet i mean in the list of what i've seen i've liked everything that i've seen so this is just for me it is (laughs) my question for myself which is look he was amazing in Curtain Call. He did great. Curtain Call could have been great. It started so strong, and I was so all in and so invested. I do not like Curtain Call. I think Curtain Call made bad decisions. I do not like where it went. I am glad it's gotten hype. I'm glad that, you know, Kong Han Nool, who I like a lot, has gotten attention for it, you know, won awards for it. We've seen Song Dong Il get nominated for his performance in it. The whole drama ended up being a miss for me, but that is not Song Dong Il. It's none of the cast's fault. The cast did not let down that drama. To me, the plot and the writing let down that drama. So I'm still mad about Curtain Call because I remember, like, I was like, oh, I'm going to, like, you know, jump into it. It looks kind of sweet. And then I was like, oh, my God, this is fucking incredible. I think I was even telling you at one point, Megan, like, oh, my God, it's so good. And, like, the beginning, I mean, like, you get into, like, the partition of, like, North and South Korea and, like, these families divided and it's heavily emotional. And you're just like, oh, my God, this is really amazing. And it's, like, getting me on, like, my core being. And then it just decided to, like, stop doing that. That's which so I obvious. still don't understand. I don't know. If anyone really loves Curtain Call, let us know, like, right in, because I'm still just baffled by why they went the directions they went. I mean, like, it's fine. And it's not fine. It's just, it ended up just being like, ugh. Whereas, like, it's, it's not fine. <laughs> like, it's not fine. Yeah, I mean, like, I want to be like, oh, whatever. Our author mm-hmm. choice. But it's just like, look, it was so good to end up, like, so, like, meh. I don't know. Mm-hmm. All right. So what's a role or character type that you would love to see Song Dong Il play? I don't feel like qualified to answer this because he's probably played everything that I could imagine him playing. I just haven't seen it. Like that list is so long. Um, Right now I'm kind of, I mean, like, I feel like a broken record, but I'm partial to him as the father figure type mentor. And I just want to watch that over and over again. Like Reply 1988 and If You Wish Upon Me. So wherever else he's doing that, I want more. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, I'd actually love to see him in like a complicated villain role, like um, like the mafia boss in My Name, or uh, like a better version of the Itawan class. Oh yeah, he'd be good. Dad. He'd be good in that. But like, who does more than just sit in his <laughs> office and plays Go and calls people to it <laughs> to talk to him and drink tea? Yeah, I want to see him kind of in this like complicated villain role. I think he would be he would be really cool. Um, and I put him down like, look, I'm always going to be a fan for like an older love story. So yes. I would just love to see like, and that was one of the things that I loved in Reply. It wasn't his role. He had a marriage that you know, like they had some cool stuff just dealing with like them and their marriage. But, um, you know, Techie's dad and yes. how he had like, more mature romance. I want to see, like, he'd be great. I want to see him really having a solid romance. That's something that I'm really enjoying in Alchemy of Souls is that there's so much longing going on between, like, multiple people. And so, like, oh, even yeah. in, like, the older, like, maidservant and, like, stuff yes. like that. Like, it's so fun. Like, I love getting to see people my age flirting. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, you can. And not just the twenty-four-year-old. Oh my god! (laughs) Stop it. it. (laughs) And then, okay, so Song Dong Il, we decided to talk about him tonight just because we realized that, like, lately we're just seeing him like in everything, and so we thought it would be fun to just pay a little homage to him. But who is another actor or actress that's just appearing in so many dramas for you suddenly? Like you just look around and everywhere you glance, you're seeing that person. Yeah, I feel I feel like it's like when someone's like, you know, I see everywhere I go, I see my exact car. And it's because like you just start noticing what you notice because you see your car every day. And I feel like for me, it's it's Yum Hairan that I've been seeing everywhere. But like it started in the very beginning and I didn't realize that. Like, the the where have I seen this person before started when we watched When the Camellia Blooms. And I was like, why? Why is she so familiar? So I do, as I always do, and I go to my favorite resource, which, which is Asian Wiki. And for fuck's sake, she's Untak's horrible aunt in Goblin. And none of us had realized that. I remember messing, messaging you both and being like, oh, my God, do you know who we know? Do you know where we know her from? Um, yeah, she's Untak's aunt. So from there, I feel like she's been everywhere. Like, we just saw her in The Glory Part 1 and 2, and then boom, she has a cameo in Episode 1 of Alchemy of Souls that we all just started after finishing The Glory. Like, literally, I'm like, is that her? And she, yeah, she's just in, she's in the very beginning there. And then, I, you know, we've seen her in, hop, I've seen her in Hospital Playlist, Lawless Lawyer, and Prison Playbook. So that's six dramas that I've seen her in, which isn't a ton, but in such, I feel like a short span of time, it makes it feel like she's everywhere. And I love her. So that's fine. Yeah, I forgot she was in Lawless Lawyer. She was like the, the wife, the like working. Yeah, the, the wife who worked yeah. all the time. So I actually have two. First, I'm going to say On Nay Song. So I recently saw him in Unlock Your Boss, and I thought, oh my god, this guy is everywhere. And I'm right. His wiki page is longer than Sung Dong Il's. <laughs> <laughs> he was born in 1969, so he's obviously usually playing, like, Odyssey roles now. A- and he's, I mean, he's been in so many dramas that I'm not really sh- sure where to start, but here are a few. He's in, he was in Rain or Shine, 18 Again, Mouse, Law School, Racket Boys, the Devil Judge, and his latest credit is for The Secret Romantic Guest House. And then I also want to shout out Kim Sun Young, who we all know, she was one of the North Korean uh, villagers in Love Her. Crash Land- er, yeah, Crash Landing on You. And she has been in so freaking much. Like, I remember I she was in her private life as like the... We didn't recognize her no, in the beginning. She was in her private life as like the um gallery owner but she like always had those weird outfits on oh my but she was so good she was in the silent sea yeah and it looks like she was recently in crash course in romance which we haven't seen yet but i just like her list is i mean she was in reply uh yeah but um yeah anyway so i just i love her so much every time i every time i see her i'm like oh this is gonna be good because like she knows how to turn out a performance and amy i was gonna say yom hairan too just because i feel like everywhere i look suddenly like there they are (laughs) yeah it's wild but you know you said that so i'm gonna go with um uh gim mi kyung so from healer to heirs to it's okay to not be okay to her private life to a hell of a lot more I mean, I just feel like she's just... She used to be everywhere. Like, I feel like I haven't seen her in, like, a few dramas. I haven't seen her in some of the more recent stuff, like How to Sell Your Haunted House. And then most recently, she was in Crash Course on Romance, which is also really popular. Oh, so that is... Yeah, no, she's doing, like, two to three a year still. I just haven't seen some of the very last ones. But I just feel like I'm still going to hold her as a standard. There was, like, a period where every drama I saw, she was in. I do feel like there was a a moment there where everything I saw she was in. I love her in Healer so yeah, much. Yeah, I, I love her a lot, so. Oh, Healer, she was so good! I love her in Healer. Her oh my gosh. Bap- <laughs> just without cutting it, just digging right in. As like a hoagie. Yeah. <laughs> she was eating it like a hoagie. <sighs> so, well, that was fun. Yeah, I mean, really, it was just, we wanted to do kind of a fun love letter to a character actor that we just see a lot and we always 
whenever you see him, you just know like he's gonna be the. Same. It's gonna yeah. be good. Like even it, like like you said, like even if the drama's not the best drama, he's gonna be good in it. Yeah. So if you have somehow stumbled into K drama land and have not seen something with Sung Dong Il yet, you're gonna start noticing him everywhere, and you're gonna be happy that you do and remedy that. But yeah. Highly, highly wreck if you're looking for a drama of his to watch and you want to see him rip your heart out, If You Wish Upon Me or Reply 1988 or both of them. If you want to see him go the total other direction and just be a vicious serial killer, then I recommend Legend of the Blue Sea. And he's vicious? No, I mean, like... No, I mean, so he, I actually think that his character is more vicious in the previous lifetime, you know, because like I said, there's reincarnation right. and he's, he's basically trying to, to find the same, to find and, and kill the same people. Um, and so he's much more conniving and, um, and vicious in the past. In the present, he's a little bit more not him and his performance, but the type of character is a little bit more one note um, until he kind of realizes who he is and who he was and, and what he's doing. So there's like a lot of, you know, remembering past lives kind of stuff happening. But yeah, it's Legend of the Blue Sea has a lot of comedy to it, too. So it's not like a super dark um, drama by any means. But yeah, he is this like creepy serial killer. Yeah, crazy. I just can't see him creepy, but I want to see it just to see I don't think I would find him creepy now to go back and watch it again because I know who Sung Dong Il is. Yeah, <laughs> like I feel like it would. I feel like it would. The performance would come across very differently now. That makes sense. So okay. yeah, we love him. Well, happy happy almost Sung Dong Il day because April twenty seventh is coming up. Mm-hmm. So we wish him a happy early birthday. We do. And if you have another character that like just not another character, another actual person who's real, but plays characters <laughs> you enjoy, let us know too because. You know, I think that these could be fun just doing like the occasional deep dives on an actor because we really like to do drama deep dives. I think they're super fun and they make sense with like the premise of our podcast of like looking at things through a writer's lens. But the other thing we're aware of is that like we're not always watching the same things at the same time. And we want to like occasionally talk about things beyond just like a single story structure so looking at you know topics that span multiple dramas or actors now that might span multiple dramas i think is a fun a fun direction so yeah if you've got things that you would like to see like namely oh this one character like this one person keeps coming up and they're such a good character actor and we would love to see like just hear more about them and like learn a bit more about them and connect more about them you know we're down so And I think it all fits within the umbrella of what we do because, you know, character development is super important and, and not, you know, sometimes you can, like you brought up with curtain call, like you can be really great actors, but have a script that fails you. um, But the performance is still going to be a worthy performance because there's good character portrayal. So anyway, happy birthday, Sung Dong Il. Thank (laughs) you for being in all of our favorite dramas. Yeah. And thanks for listening to us tonight. We'll see you next time. Annyeong! Annyeong! Kamsamnida! Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K pop and K skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, Annyeong!